Thank you, Vicki. Okay, so welcome everyone. And uh, <clears throat> uh, we're going to introduce you to a hands-on tool that can be used for spatial habitat protection of the 130 species of marine mammals, as well as the associated biodiversity. Uh, 130, these 130 species include 90 species of whales, dolphins, and porpoises, 33 seals, sea lions, and, and the walrus, uh, sea otter and river otter, uh, dugong, manatees, and the polar bear. And the interesting thing about these species is that they are, uh, or one of the many interesting things is that they are tethered to the surface by their need to breathe air. So this means that we can monitor them uh, in the open ocean and in rivers and uh, wherever they appear. And it means that uh, we have a good indicator of biodiversity as well as the health of the sea and what's potentially below. So this project um, started with uh, thinking about um, marine protected areas uh, uh, for whales and dolphins and other uh, marine mammal species uh, some years ago. Um, and in two editions of a book that I wrote called Marine Protected Areas for Whales, Dolphins and Porpoises, uh, we tried to look at every um, habitat uh, protection area around the world that uh, included um, whales and dolphins uh, and other marine mammals. And we came up with a map like this. This is a sort of summation of what the many areas that were in the book. The red areas are uh, marine protected areas that exist. Uh, the blue areas proposed. The tan areas were EBSAs, ecologically or biologically significant areas with some marine mammal habitat. And then there are other smaller designations that, I mean, most of these are really just dots on the map anyway. And, and what we found really was that these were largely, um, they may have started out as habitat protection, but really um, shaped by socioeconomic concerns and political concerns, they really evolved into uh, you know, shapes on the map that had uh, sometimes a relationship to habitat, but many times not. And the other thing was that most of these areas are on the coastlines or around islands and really don't reflect 90% uh, of the habitat, the potential habitat for these animals. Uh, and really ad hoc or incidental protection was the rule. Um, a lot of species weren't covered like the beaked whales and, and we just started to realize this was not good enough. And at the same time, um, some of us, uh, Mike Tetley and Giuseppe Notobartolo de Sciara, started attending uh, the EBSA workshops for the Convention on Biological Diversity and started uh, to, in, you know, to put more marine mammals into the picture. But before that, the data for marine mammals was spread out to such an extent and there was no sort of universal way to, to get uh, that very disparate data into the processes, the international processes that were going on. So in 2013 in Marseille at the uh, Marine Protected Area Congress, uh, we um, started the um, IUCN uh, Marine Mammal Protected Areas Task Force uh, within the Species Survival Commission of IUCN, as well as the World Commission on Protected Areas. And so it was nicely situated be uh, between both of those um, commissions. And we decided we were going to focus on a number of objectives and really this bottom of objective, enhancing the capacity with new conservation tools became our dominant focus. And we were very much inspired by um, bird life and the important bird and biodiversity areas, the IBAs. And really uh, we, we needed a way to, uh, um, to do it a little bit differently. We couldn't go through the long um, two or three decade uh, process of building up 
a thousand or more organizations around the world, we had to develop another system for getting these, um, uh, um, what, what came to be called important marine mammal areas, IMAs, into uh, um, world conservation use as a tool. So that was our challenge at the outset. We spent several years trying to get the criteria organized and, and really um, uh, in the middle, of, after I present these initial slides, Giuseppe will talk more about the criteria. So uh, the, we're talking about a place-based conservation tool, and this is the definition we came up with, discrete portions of habitat important for one or more marine mammal species that have the potential to be delineated and managed for conservation. So these are not marine protected areas. They're not identified on the basis of management considerations. Uh, they are evidence driven purely, this is a purely biocentric process uh, based on uh, applying scientific criteria to um, on, uh, on the best available science. So this is um, what we've worked with, what we've come up with uh, so far, the areas that we've covered. Um, when the Gobi um, Iki grant came through in uh, 2016, we had also had the good fortune of uh, developing a pilot project through the MAVA Foundation um, for the Mediterranean. So we started off in the Mediterranean um, in late 2016. To, um, to identify the IMAs there, and then move to these other areas in the Southern Hemisphere, which we have now completed except for the uh, diagonal stripe area off the west coast of South America, Latin America, which is, um, we were supposed to do last September, but because of COVID have had to uh, postpone it, and now we think we will try and do this as an online workshop. Um, but these other areas are all um, completed. So uh, each workshop, the process is that they follow this predefined um, process that, you know, that we've developed um, in consultation with uh, regional marine mammal science scientists and conservationists uh, to identify candidate IMAs. Um, based on these proposals that we get for areas of interest. And these can be submitted by anyone. In practice, most of them come from participants of the workshop, but we also use EBSAs and, uh, that have marine mammal content and other um, areas, um, you know, any, anything that we can use that has marine mammal content, we will put in as an area of interest to be considered by the group. And after these one week long workshops, the candidate images are submitted to independent um, review panel of experts, uh, you know, to verify that the criteria were applied okay and everything uh, is based on uh, robust information. Uh, and then the candidate images become images and they're put on the website uh, with the, um, uh, the address you see below, the IMA E Atlas. So the three stages, we, the stage one areas of interest that we collected that I mentioned, and uh, then they go into the workshop where the uh, 30 to 50 uh, scientists um, in each workshop will um, uh, propose them as candidate images. So we have a lot of, we have one um, contact, uh, um, one uh, point of contact who will become the person who uh, takes charge of that, but really these are accepted by the whole workshop, proposed and accepted. So there's some robustness in that alone. And then the um, stage three after the review uh, becoming a, um, a full IMA. And this is just a, a quick, I have a few of these quick illustrations to show you what um, the process looks like in the Mediterranean. This was the, these were the initial areas of interest that, that uh, before the workshop, and then during the workshop, um, this is the kind of thing you come up with um, that then goes to the reviewers, and then this is the final um, tally. 
uh, we do leave some areas as candidate emmas um, and some areas just stay as areas of interest because we think it's valuable to keep those alive and on the map. Those might be future emmas. Those are areas where we want to focus for future research. Um, there's a lot of value to those as well as the uh, approved emmas. So this was the um, South Pacific, which was our uh, first Gobi workshop. And uh, the second process at the workshop came up with this, and then the final right here. And then this is uh, Northeast Indian Ocean and Southeast Asian Seas. You can see the pre-workshop areas of interest, and then the candidate images, and then the review results. So this is um, really our, uh, our um, coordinating central uh, repository for a lot of this information. We don't, we don't hold the data or anything, but we have all the tools um, available um, from this website and, and the map and the connections to the map being the key part of it. Now, just recently we announced um, the uh, endanger, the uh, extended Southern Ocean, uh, which was actually sponsored by the French Biodiversity Agency, um, uh, which was an additional workshop we were able to do, as well as Australia, New Zealand. Um, and our tally has now come up to a 159 important marine mammal areas that have been identified worldwide. We have um, uh, two different projections on the website, so you can uh, see Antarctica without um, the bias of a flat map. And then when you click on each area, you will get um, a description, a summary, and then more detailed information and separate maps of the IMA with the size and the qualifying species and criteria. And these are just scenes from some of the uh, workshops that we've done um, from around the world. It's been very interesting going through the uh, uh, Southern Hemisphere. Uh, we've also had a component of our workshop um, with three different areas that we've worked on implementing marine mammals in Palau, uh, the Andaman Islands of India, and uh, 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 Mozambique, which I'll talk about a little bit about later. In, as well. So the um, 159 IMAs identified, the total area is 15.6 uh, million square kilometers. The largest area, it's really kind of an anomaly, much larger than any of the other areas. Um, 2.8 million, the Prince Edward Islands and Western Oceanic Waters IMA in the extended Southern Ocean which has habitats for uh, two species of fur seals, southern elephant seals, and killer whales. And the smallest is, is only 45 square kilometers, which is more typical for some of the Mediterranean monk seal habitats in the Mediterranean. And 51% uh, of the emmas are less than 10,000 kilometers in size, only 13% greater than 100,000. And this is on the website, this uh, chart, which just shows you the different areas and how many emmas, candidate emmas, and areas of interest we have. You'll see African Atlantic and European Atlantic. That's only because we have identified um, uh, monk seal areas. We had a special monk seal uh, workshop to try to uh, clean up all the monk seal uh, areas um, throughout the Mediterranean. Um, so that's where I'll stop and Giuseppe will take over and um, take you through the criteria and the um, uh, identification process. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Let me share my screen. Okay, stop sharing. Okay, there we go. So good afternoon, good night, and 
Good morning, everyone. Uh, so I continue now from um, Eric's presentation uh, with a little bit on, of an explanation about the um, selection criteria and the identification process. Um, so as Eric mentioned very briefly uh, before, uh, we have uh, a number of selection criteria that we're going to have an, an overview of. And then uh, uh, I'm going to uh, tell you again a little bit uh, the uh, identification process, how it happens. Uh, the uh, uh, criteria, so on the, on the uh, right-hand side here, you have the, the uh, uh, definition of the EMA uh, uh, so that you, you understand a little bit exactly what we're talking about. And um, so that the EMAs, really are um, a biocentric expert-based identification, uh, which is made in consultation with the, uh, with the best expert of that particular region that we can uh, put together. And, uh, and, and Anima is certainly not a, a marine protected area. A marine protected area is something which is uh, um, really um, uh, established by an authority that has the authority of uh, uh, coming up with the special regulations for human behavior in uh, in uh, portions of the oceans, uh, EMAs are something completely different. They are dictated only by um, uh, biocentric criteria. So, in in uh, to to put it very simply, EMAs are defined by what the animals have defined. So it's a quite uh, quite different process. Um, very briefly, the criteria that we are basing our work to identify the EMAs are four, four major categories. You see that the uh, uh, special uh, um, uh, special vulnerabilities of the uh, population or the species that we are addressing, uh, distribution and abundance characteristics, uh, key life cycle areas, and special attributes. We're going to see them a little more in detail. Um, and uh, this, uh, all this criteria work was based on, on, a, on a consultation that we uh, had made uh, over a period of almost three years, between 2013 and 2016, uh, with um, uh, over 1,000 experts within the marine mammal research and conservation community. So it's been a long work. And um, the, uh, uh, one of the challenges of uh, establishing this criteria uh, was that uh, uh, there were already existing criteria um, in other conservation prioritization classifications, such as the EBSAs, the Ecological and Biologically Important Areas of uh, Convention of Biological Diversity, the key biodiversity area concept of, uh, uh, based on the IUCN Global Standard, uh, the biologically important area uh, that were uh, independently defined by the, uh, the U.S. and Australia, uh, the critical cetacean habitat concept by the um, ACOBAMS, uh, the CMS uh, uh, agreement on the uh, Mediterranean and Black Sea um, cetaceans, and uh, finally the wetlands international of international importance of the Ramsar Convention. Uh, so. Uh, the, um, uh, the result is that, uh, so we have, as I said before, the criterion A, which is based on species uh, or population vulnerability, and we are normally basing this on the classification of the IUCN red list. Uh, this is our standard, although um, in some cases there are similar classifications that are more and more, more nation-based uh, than the, uh, the global red list. Um, then we have the uh, B criterion, uh, which is about distribution and abundance, which is divided into uh, a sub-criterion B1, small and resident populations. And uh, don't worry, uh, I'm going to give you examples of all of these now, practical examples of all of these, so that uh, you understand better what they're based on. Um, there is a, a, a second B criteria, P2, about aggregations, and then um, the uh, the C criterion about key life cycle activities involves uh, C1 for uh, breeding areas, reproductive areas, and C2 for feeding areas, and C3 for migration areas. 
And finally, the criterion D is the one involving special attributes with D1 distinctiveness, which can be either behavioral or genetic or any other uh, special feature of a population or a species. And then the uh, criterion D2, which is diversity, because there are some uh, EMAs that have been identified that are, have a, a very, very um, extraordinary amount of diversity of marine mammal species. So let's go now and see some examples. Uh, so out of these 159 EMAs which were identified, this is an example of criterion A, areas containing habitat important for the survival or recovery of threatened and declining species. And uh, one example is Palau in the uh, Pacific Islands, is part of Micronesia. And the qualifying species of the Palau ima is the dugong, uh, which is uh, actually globally uh, assessed as uh, vulnerable in the IUCN red list. But we had uh, some uh, uh, informal information from dugong experts that the population in Palau uh, might warrant uh, um, uh, being classified as critically endangered. So this is the uh, an example of criterion A. Uh, criterion, what's happening? Why is it not progressing? Okay, uh, criterion B, uh, distribution and abundance, subcriterion B1, smaller res resident populations. So these are areas supporting at least one resident population containing an important proportion of that species or populations that are occupied consistently. So an example here is the uh, EMA that was established for the Maui dolphin, which is a subspecies of the Hector's dolphin in uh, New Zealand. Uh, as you see here, the uh, area in which the Maui dolphin is, uh, the, which is important for the Maui dolphin is a very small one. Um, an example of criterion B2 aggregations, uh, uh, areas with underlying qualities that support important considerations of a species or population, uh, is the um, uh, Western Antarctic Peninsula and Islands, IMA, uh, in the uh, Southern Ocean. Uh, the qualifying species are the blue fin, humpback, and killer whales, and the Antarctic fur seal. So this is a very special area because it has it offers, you know, for, for ecological reasons, uh, um, uh, opportunities for aggregations uh, that are important. Um, C1, reproductive areas uh, that are important for a species or population to mate, give birth, and or care for young until weaning. And uh, an example here is the um, Balearic Island Shelf and Slope Ima in the Mediterranean for sperm whales. Uh, C2, feeding areas, um, areas and conditions that provide an important nutritional base on which a species or population depends. An example here is the uh, northern coast and islands of the Thracian Sea Emma in the northern Aegean Sea for harbor purposes. And uh, C3, migration areas used for important migration or other movements often connecting distinct life cycle areas or the different parts of the year around range of a non-migratory population. In this case, it is a migratory population, it's the humpback whale, and the area is the Southeast African Coastal Migration Corridor, IMA, in the Western Indian Ocean. Uh, turning on to criterion D, uh, distinctiveness areas which sustain populations with important genetic, behavioral, or ecologically distinctive characteristics. The example here is the Balik Papan Adang Anapar base Ima in the Philippines for um, Irrawaddy dolphins. And the way, the reason why it is distinctive is that the, this, um, this population here is uh, distinctive um, uh, genetically uh, in, par in particular for what con pertains to the mitochondrial uh, uh, diversity. And finally, uh, the uh, criterion D2, uh, diversity areas containing habitat that supports an important diversity of marine mammal species. An example here, uh, a foremost example, is the Maldives archipelago and adjacent oceanic waters, EMAs, 
that host um, 22 species of cetaceans as qualifying species. So really extraordinary. This is one of the richest one we found. So um, to sum it up, uh, the criteria that were used to identify the EMAs, here you can see that uh, A, B, and C, the B, A, B, and C family of criteria occupy more or less uh, similar size in terms of uh, percentage. And um, uh, the, uh, of course, the D uh, criteria uh, are a little less representative, but they are pretty well spread out uh, along the EMAs that we have been identifying so far. And uh, one thing that I um, have not said before is that in order to identify um, an EMA, you don't need more than one criterion. Yeah, if you have one good criterion, that is good enough. If you have more, of course, you can use them, but you don't need more than one. Uh, in terms of the, uh, the species, uh, here you can see that um, in, in these graphs, where uh, only the species that are listed as uh, qualifying species more than four times are shown. So there is a number of other emas that have been uh, having qualifying species only less than four times. But these are the species that occur uh, more often. And you see that uh, so far humpback whales have been, you know, leading the uh, the charge, and of course, dugongs have been very important. But this is mostly because we have been uh, very much concentrating on the uh, on the um, southern hemisphere and uh, and mostly in the Indian and the Pacific Ocean. So that's why dugongs are so well represented. And um, uh, I anticipate that um, as we will be moving onto uh, you know uh, northern hemisphere regions, uh, the Arctic, et cetera, we will have, a, a, of course, a, a much wider representation of pinnipeds uh, and, uh, and species that are more typical of the Northern Hemisphere. Um, now, uh, concerning the process, um, as uh, Eric uh, showed you before, uh, we have a pre-workshop uh, situation in which uh, we uh, collect uh, areas of interest and uh, create an inventory of knowledge uh, in a data appraisal form. Uh, in other words, we try to collect all the possible information that we can about that particular region. Uh, and the, um, uh, we, we do that from all different sources. We um, spread the word uh, through listserv like Marmam. Uh, we uh, spread the word with colleagues that we know are uh, active in that particular region. Uh, we take uh, information from databases like Protected Planet, um, uh, the uh, EPSA, the repository from the Convention on Biological Diversity, uh, IUCN and BirdLife uh, uh, colleagues. Uh, then uh, during the expert workshop, uh, all the uh, submissions of the areas of interest are being reviewed. Uh, the participants are assigned uh, to um, working groups uh, examining uh, uh, separately uh, the uh, potential candidate EMAs. And uh, uh, the greatest part of this five-day workshop, it really is uh, um, um, used by, to draft the CEMA submissions. Uh, uh, at the end of the workshop, which lasts five days, uh, there is a collective agreement on the final uh, candidate email list, so that um, there is some, forth, uh, some form of authoritiveness coming from the collective wisdom of the people that are uh, uh, gathered uh, during the workshop. And, uh, and then uh, this is the template for the drafting candidate email submission. And then it all uh, uh, is uh, being sent to an ind independent uh, uh, review panel. Uh, and the reviewers uh, go through all the submissions and um, uh, based on the information which is contained in the, uh, in the uh, candidate EMA submissions, they decide whether uh, the proposal uh, is uh, worthy of being uh, confirmed as EMA status. 
or it, it requires um, uh, some corrections that can be done uh, without uh, having to uh, go through a collective workshop again. Uh, and these remain candid edema uh, because they can be corrected any time. Uh, or uh, a request for additional research or a different, uh, additional effort and to go through um, uh, another uh, regional workshop again. And, and these uh, remain uh, areas of interest. Um, I need to do something about this because I don't see the title. Where can I? I need to move this. All right, here it is. Okay. Uh, in terms of guidance on uh, EMA delineation, um, we have uh, sorry, yeah. we have um, uh, there are some uh, uh, guidance that we can uh, uh, offer during the workshops because the uh, you know one thing is to decide that that particular uh, portion of uh, of of water of ocean or seas or a river um, is important for that particular uh, uh, species or population. And, and that is normally, you know, if you apply the criteria, is normally fairly straightforward uh, if the data exists, of course. Uh, but then the difficulty comes when you have to put a line to draw a line around this area. So um, there's been uh, a guidance that's been prepared uh, to uh, help in that um, in, in in that process. So, um, for example, uh, there are features uh, which are uh, spatially stable. Uh, features that are spatially stable but rely on modeled evidence. Uh, the first one were support by directly observed evidence. Uh, features that are not spatially fixed. Uh, uh, they are dynamic, uh, supported by direct observed evidence, and then other features that are uh, 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 based on modeling. So uh, these are all, uh, for example, in number one could be uh, reef. Uh, um, uh, number two could be uh, um, uh, something that uh, comes out of modeling because there's been, you know, highly highly productive uh, um, prediction of, of high productivity, et cetera. So these are all different, uh, uh, different, um, uh, I wouldn't call them criteria, different ways of uh, uh, determining whether, uh, you know, where anima uh, begins and where it stops. Uh, there are um, other types of, of evidence that we are using for example, with point observations or with um, habitat use uh, probability uh, and with density estimates, and then we can put them all together and see what comes out. Um, we, we can have also uh, multi-species uh, EMAs, which happens very often because uh, normally uh, if an area is particularly suitable for a marine mammal, it's very likely that it's suitable for other species of marine mammals. So in that case, uh, you know, we, we have ways of, uh, of putting the two uh, inf types of information together. And then also um, uh, keeping in mind that um, uh, marine mammals live in a three-dimensional environment, we have to take into consideration also the fact that uh, many of these mammals are divers, for example. And, uh, and uh, so uh, we need also to have that, that sort of consideration to uh, come uh, into the, uh, the decision of where uh, anima uh, is, uh, how it is uh, delimited. Uh, there are currencies uh, uh, of information that are primary or more important, like the abundance uh, of animals, probability of occurrence, etc. Others that are secondary, but um, they um, uh, are perhaps not so um, uh, so determinant, but uh, need to be considered as well. So uh, I just gave you you know a very quick overview of what we uh, we have to go through in each uh, 
region in order to decide uh, uh, you know where the EMS should be located um, but one thing which is very important is that the EMS if uh, they uh, should they be limited to just a, an academic exercise uh, they are um, they are good for nothing uh, the reason uh, of being for the EMS is that we hope uh, that eventually uh, whoever is deciding about you know uh, regulating uh, the presence uh, of humans at sea and their activities are, are taking into consideration the EMS uh, in order to ensure that the marine mammals that live in these EMS and the, for which the, the EMS are important, as the name says, um, are, are being taken into due consideration. So the important thing is that um, the EMA, uh, the, um, the, uh, the, the knowledge contained by the EMA is being used uh, to uh, is being put to good use, and in fact, um, uh, after you know we are going to stop the presentation and go to the question and act and answer session. Uh, I'm very pleased to tell you that you know our colleague Simone Panigada is with us, who is a, a particularly uh, an expert of the um, ship strikes uh, problem in which you know uh, vessels and um, and marine mammals coming to collision, and uh, and he will be able to give you some very good examples on how EMS are actually going to be put to use. So, um, but uh, let let me uh, give you just a, a brief overview of uh, of how the EMS have been actually uh, in this past few years. Uh, uh, being uh, um, raising uh, some attention. Uh, so there is a number of uh, marine conservation and management initiatives that are using the products of the EMA process. One of them is the, um, the CBD, Convention on Biological Diversity, uh, EPSA process, the Ecologically or Biologically Significant Areas. Another is, the, is a process that has been, is being now used very much uh, throughout uh, the world by uh, a very large number of countries is to go through marine spatial planning, MSP, uh, in order to manage and to try to optimize uh, human activities at sea. Uh, for example, uh, for what pertains to shipping, fishing, uh, industrial scientific exploration, etc. Uh, of course, the uh, design and uh, uh, establishment and management and monitoring of marine protected areas, which was the uh, actually the, the, our starting point. Uh, of course, the um, key biodiversity areas identified uh, by the IUCN standard. Uh, navies uh, that conduct relate uh, conduct uh, sonar testing and use and exercises in the ocean. Uh, particularly sensitive sea areas by the International Maritime Organization and other designations by AMO and, uh, and the International Whaling Commission, which, uh, as you will see, has a role as far as the um, uh, specific uh, problem of uh, ship strikes is concerned. Very uh, importantly, in 20, at the end of 2017, there was a um, convention um, a uh, meeting of the parties, a conference of the parties of the Convention on Migratory Species in Manila. And uh, in, at, the, um, at this CMS uh, resolution 1213, uh, specifically to acknowledge the uh, EMAS and their criteria and process and requesting parties and inviting range states to identify specific areas where the um, uh, identification of EMS could be beneficial. So that was a, a very important uh, moment in, uh, in our very short history. Uh, so uh, a follow-up uh, of all this, uh, the EPSAs have included uh, EMA layers in, um, have, have uh, solved include EMA layers in future revisions of the EPSA process. Uh, marine spatial planning has been taking EMAS into consideration. 
Uh, MPAs have been proposed in Vietnam, Bangladesh, and other countries using IMA information. Uh, about 30 key biodiversity areas have been identified based on IMAs uh, identified in um, IMA workshops. Uh, the US Navy has used EMAS to indicate where they will avoid testing low frequency sonar. And the IWC, I have to move this bars here so I can read what's underneath. The IWC has adopted EMAS to identify ship strikes issues and will work with the IMO to help in identifying speed and lane restrictions. So, uh, before concluding, I just wanted to attract your attention on uh, the um, a database of the EMAS, which is searchable, well, like all database, I guess, uh, but is searchable by anybody on the, on the uh, EMAS website, uh, so that uh, anybody can go and search and, and, and find out about the EMAS and the uh, candidate EMAS and AOIs. And let me see if there's anything. Okay, I am finished. Okay, Eric. Hey, okay, thank you, Giuseppe. Um, I'm just, I have a, just a couple more slides to, um, uh, to advance. Let's see, I need to push this ahead. I'm sorry. Oh. Let's see, I don't know how to do this quickly, um, but I will start talking while I'm advancing these. Um, we're, um, I'm going to show you shortly a map of the Pelagos Sanctuary, um, which was um, signed into law in 2002 um, with, uh, let's see, 80, it was the size of 87,000 square kilometers um, and it was an area important for sperm and fin whales, various dolphins, um, Cuvier's beaked whales. And this was really a landmark transboundary MPA. Um, uh, but uh, I think the interesting thing is that if we had had IMAs identified before the Pelagos Sanctuary was declared, it would have looked quite a bit different um, because the IMA that is in um, uh, that is located there. Here, we're coming up to it now. Apologies for that. Um, the IMA, the, the orange area shown here, is uh, extending, it's, it's partly in the diamond-shaped Pelago Sanctuary, but it's also extending out to the west. And in fact, this is an area where uh, Simone Penegata and others um, with ACABAMS and uh, European Cetacean Society and other governments uh, and the IMO are really focused on because um, ships are hitting sperm whales and fin whales, especially fin whales, uh, in this prime area. So, uh, but we see now that the IMA can actually play a role in terms of defining either a wider mandate for the management of the Pelago Sanctuary or indeed putting into place other provisions uh, for conservation of uh, fin whales and sperm whales uh, so that they avert these, um, uh, the issues of ship strike and, and as well as noise as well, noise. Um, and then uh, I wanted to just show you a couple last slides from um, our trip last November to Mozambique uh, to look at um, the Bazaruto archipelago um, to Inhambani Bay, uh, Ima, which had just been declared a few months before uh, at our uh, workshop and, and approved. And this turns out to be um, a prime area for dugong, actually the last stronghold for dugong uh, in, in East Africa, in all of Africa for that matter, 300 dugong. And what we found was that the, um, uh, the archipelago, the Bazaruto Archipelago uh, National Marine Park, which is shown on the left-hand side, uh, and is really occupies a fairly um, concise small area at the bottom of the IMA, was the only area that was protected. 
and African parks were, uh, you know, perceived to be doing a good job there, but they were not extending their mandate outside of that area. So we met with government and local um, uh, conservation um, conservationists and scientists, and uh, and really tried to impress upon them the fact that. Um, that there needed to be wider protection for dugong. And as a result, um, partly, um, uh, the, um, we, we feel that the IMA, we found out a few months later that, the, uh, that Sasol had withdrawn its oil and gas leases right in the heart of this um, dugong habitat. And we think the IMA uh, really was part of the contribution to this situation where they felt they had to withdraw and um, uh, and to give that area back to the government. Now the, now the ball is really in the government's court to see what will happen in terms of extending African parks mandate or actually extending the protected area. Uh, but it's a concrete example of what we see happening with some of these emas and may happen in other parts of the world. So this was just the uh, resubmission template. So the last slide, I, uh, we, you know, we see um, going forward that IMAs can give international scientific recognition to contribute to local and national protection efforts uh, with baseline studies. You know, if we can develop a, develop a monitoring pro protocol for IMAs, uh, these are going to be great places to monitor against various threats to cetaceans, including the longer range climate change. Uh, we see him as playing a role in the BBNJ process on the high seas. Uh, we, we of course need to close a lot of data gaps on the high seas and we see some of these other tools like satellite uh, images for whale detection and eDNA and uh, wave gliders and um, other um, uh, uh, passive and active acoustics plus modeling being useful to uh, uh, identify IMAs on the high seas. But that has to be a big part of our future work. We're moving into the Northern Hemisphere, hopefully in 2022, um, and uh, also have to do the South Atlantic. Um, so we have about, I guess, 10 more regions, um, in, mostly in the Northern Hemisphere. Uh, that, that really need to be done. But we see this as a process of, of that could be done every 10 years, that it would take about 10 years to, uh, to cover the ocean in using the method that, that we've developed. And so our, you know, the, what we see going down is a lot of work towards selling and implementing this IMA tool and really integrating it with all the other conservation tools uh, being used by our partners in the GOBI process and uh, outside in the wider world. So thank you very much everyone for listening and uh, we're now um, uh, sending this back to you, um, Vicki, and we're open to a question and answer session. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, uh, Giuseppe, for your excellent presentations. Um, and at this point, I have to send an apology to Simone because I neglected to uh, introduce him at the start of our uh, webinar. So um, appearing on your screens now, ladies and gentlemen, is Simone Panigada, Panigada who is also part of the, uh, the IMA team, and he will also be helping to field the questions. So um, we've had a few questions come in. Um, quite a few of them actually are about the uh, geographic coverage of the IMA process so far. So lots of interest um, about when areas in the Northern Hemisphere um, are, are going to be covered under the process, which um, Eric, you've just alluded to, but um, specifically people have asked about um, the Cape Verdes, about the Baltic Sea um, and other areas in the Northeast Atlantic. So do you have a, a, a definite time frame yet, Eric? We don't have a definite time frame, but we, we are, are looking at the Atlantic next, and it will, it will be um, actually five different areas um, to the Northeast and Northwest Atlantic, and the Southeast and Southwest, you know, the African and Latin American Atlantic, and then the Caribbean and Gulf of Mexico. So that's five separate workshops. Um, we're, we're now looking um, actively for funding and talking with funders. So, but there is nothing definite uh, that we can promise yet, but we'll, 
you know, we're, we're going full steam on it and hope to get there soon. Okay, thank you. Uh, right, now I've got a whole load of questions here, so I'm just going to take them from the top in the order in which they appear in my Q&A box. So um, Anna Adamo says, a very interesting and an inclusive process. As you mentioned, the IMAs are, for the time being, an academic exercise and not MPAs or based on management consideration. You also showed the implementation of IMAs. Do you think that this process could be considered as good example or best practice for other marine species or habitats currently excluded in specific directives or policies? Someone will have to answer. Ah, Giuseppe, please. Yeah. So, yeah, uh, well, the uh, first I want to say, the EMAs are an academic exercise is not entirely correct. Uh, the EMAs are a scientific exercise, but they are planned to be used for management. So they are carefully, any management or human uh, component is being kept out of them in the phase of their identification because it is uh, it has to be rigorously science-based, but uh, what we don't want is that they remain an academic exercise because they are a tool that we are offering to decision makers so that their decisions when they regulate human activities at sea are made with the best possible scientific base. And, uh, and therefore, no excuse for not knowing wherever there is something to be known. And there is something to be known in a large portion of the oceans. Unfortunately, there is also a large portion of the oceans where we don't know enough. That's very unfortunate. And, uh, but we're, hopefully the scientific community is gonna work at that. Coming to the second part of the question, um, uh, I think uh, it is, well, of course, you know, the bird people have started before everybody else, like always. And so we, with marine mammals, we have been um, taking the example and uh, admiring it and trying to apply, uh, applying it to the, uh, the mammals of the ocean. There's a lot of stuff out there still that needs attention. I know that the uh, marine turtle people are very close to um, uh, coming up with the uh, important marine total areas. I think this is not far in the future. Uh, I think uh, this, is, this is great, it's really wonderful. Um, but also, I think eventually the shark people should do something about that because there is quite a bit known about sharks and rays that uh, can uh, you know, be used to, to that purpose. Unfortunately, most of the shark and ray information uh, scientific information that exists is based on fisheries. So uh, we'll have to, you know, be careful not to be too biased in that direction. But um, yes, so the, the answer is yes. It's a very short, very long answer, but the short one is yes. Thank you, Giuseppe. Uh, now, a question from um, Imran Samad, who says, thank you for the really informative presentation. I wanted to know what happens to areas of interest that do not qualify as candidate IMAs. Do they retain their status so that they can be assessed later? Who wants to take that one? Eric. Yeah, well, some of them do. So, some of the, uh, it, it depends on the workshop itself. Um, so there, there, there are a number of categories of areas of interest. So the areas of interest that go into the initial workshop, um, but the, the, air, the participants then decide which areas of interest will go forward along with the candidate IMAs. So that's the first tier of decision making. So I would say very few of the original areas of interest actually go forward. Um, but the ones that the group says are important, yes, or are areas of interest are go forward. Then when the reviewers um, go through their process and go, and go back and forth to the uh, points of contact, some of those areas um, don't meet um, the, um, uh, you know, uh, don't, don't 
manage to become IMAs, and they either revert to becoming candidate IMAs or areas of interest. So we don't lose any of those um, areas that go forward to the reviewers as candidate IMAs. Those will, you know, the, the 20 to 30% that are turned down at any workshop um, from the ones that go forward as candidate IMAs, those will be captured and kept and go on the map as areas of interest. So that's, that's uh, in a nutshell, what uh, the ones that explains which ones we keep. It's a little bit complicated, but uh, we feel that there is a robustness um, in the areas of interest that remain on the map because they have either been nominated by the group or been turned down by the reviewers, but still recognized. Thanks, Eric. Um, now, I'm going to switch to the chat uh, window now because I have a couple of questions come in from uh, Kathleen Haas, which I would like to put to you before they disappear off my screen again. Uh, firstly, she asks, are there any proposals for immers in the Pacific Northwest to protect the southern resident killer whales? Simone, your turn. <laughs> Yeah, I, I can probably address this. Thank you. Good, good day, everyone. The Pacific Northwest has not been targeted by our effort since it was mainly involved in the Southern Hemisphere and the area around Antarctica. The funding effort right now is focusing on the Atlantic, but next it will be the Pacific. So I can envisage then funding allowing and COVID-19 allowing in the next few years, uh, we will be certainly tackling, uh, as uh, Eric was saying before, also the North uh, Pacific and therefore the area involved by the killer whales. Thank you. Oh, Eric. I could add to that, that um, of course, the um, uh, Southern community killer whales are an endangered species under the US Endangered Species Act, which, which gives them um, a certain amount of gravitas in conservation. And, and I think there's no, and also there's an enormous amount of work that's been done uh, in that part of the world since the uh, mid 1970s to, to uh, document the habitats of that area. And there have been, um, I've seen maps with very, you know, careful, I mean, there's the critical habitat map from the endangered species uh, program in the US you know, we're, because part of that um, is that a part of being named an endangered species is that you have to declare critical habitat. And that was recently expanded. So I, I'm, I have no doubt that that will become a pretty easy to get candidate Emma that would then go into the process. But uh, as, as, as uh, Simone says, it will take some time now to before we get there. But there are other provisions that are, you know, that are working in favor of protection of that uh, habitat. Thank you. Now, Kathleen actually asked a second question, uh, which I'm going to throw out there, but I'm not sure that anyone's really got an answer to this yet. She says, uh, with regards to IMAs in BBNJ, who would regulate and manage these? <laughs> Vicky, you should ask. Answer that. I'm not going to. I'm not going to go there. <laughs> I'm not going to go there. But I, di I didn't want to not ask the question. But of course. Uh, Jurisdiction in BBNJ is a, a big topic of discussion at the moment. So uh, we'll have to wait and see how those negotiations turn out. Right, uh, back to our Q&A uh, platform. Uh, now, there's um, some very um, interesting questions in here. So let me pick one. Uh, Ross McGill asks, uh, given that some of the species are highly mobile and migratory, are there instances where an IMA would function more dynamically? For example, only for certain times of the year when species are known to be present. Simone? Yeah, I can give it a go and then you can, uh, you can add. Yes, of course, uh, we all know that these species are uh, migratory and some of them are more migratory than, than others. And a simple case would be, for example, the gray whales uh, of uh, Mexico. Once we will be working there, there will be certainly candidate imas in the lagoons uh, and they will have a stronger seasonal uh, and seasonality because during six months of the year the whales are not uh, are not there so that would be a fairly simple case uh, to handle 
in the Mediterranean, we have similar situation with uh, fin whales, for example, that tend uh, not to migrate, but to leave a specific, specific area. So if we know very well where the whales uh, move and how the whales move, uh, we could uh, suggest uh, migratory imas uh, or imas where fin whales migrate and uh, protect them. Otherwise, uh, we tend to concentrate effort where they, we know they breed, we know they feed uh, and uh, concentrate imas there until we have more information on, uh, on migration. And uh, this links uh, to some of our colleagues uh, working on the migratory, my, my, MICO, for example, within uh, the Gobi Iki project, who are un addressing a, a very similar topic to this. Thanks, Simone. Uh, Giuseppe. Yeah, no, oh, and was... Eric. <laughs> Giuseppe <laughs> first, then Eric. Yeah, I wanted to add, uh, you know, the. Um... Add to, to what Simone said correctly is that the uh, the temporal uh, part um, in in animals that migrate, uh, um, which is making that the animals can be absent from an ema in part of the season, doesn't detract anything from the importance of that ema. So it has to be in, you know that that habitat has to be kept uh, in good shape also when the animals are somewhere else. If, um, uh, if for me as a human, a supermarket is an important area, it is still an important area when I go to sleep um, because the next day I want to go to the supermarket to buy my food, right? So it has to be, uh, a, a, the IMA is permanent, even though we can uh, say in the description of the IMA that the importance of that IMA uh, is permanent but the presence of the animals is not. Eric, do you wish to add to that? I was just gonna add the, uh, the fact that a lot of the Imas um, are trying to accommodate the fact that marine mammals move around a lot by being larger than the immediate core area. So, so we do have some accommodation in the size of the areas. Um, you know, they're seasonal, as Giuseppe and Simone said, but they're also a little bit larger than you might imagine um, if you were trying to, you know, give this sort of peak area where they are. They're a little bit larger than that to accommodate the movement, but they're not movable in the sense of dynamic marine protected areas that, you know, that we've talked about um, in the MPA world for some years. They're not like that because it's it's not an MPA anyway. We're giving an indication, you know, you may want to make a dynamic MPA out of an IMA, um, and then you you do it a little bit differently. It's going to be interesting when we go to the Costa Rica Dome, and it will be very interesting to hear from Mar Viva in the in the Gobiiki uh, strand the of uh, the webinar uh, because that is an area that moves all along the coast of Central America and shrinks and expands and moves into the high seas and moves, stays in national waters sometimes. And, uh, you know, trying to figure out how that, how we will uh, accommodate that in the IMA process, which we'll be doing probably in February um, with our next workshop uh, will be very interesting, but, but also to hear Mar Viva where I can hardly wait for that one. Thank you. Indeed, uh, a good, a good lineup of webinars to come between now and the end of January. Uh, right, the, the questions are still coming in, so um, bear with us. I know we've gone over our hour, but from our side, there's no uh, limit on time for this this afternoon. So um, stick with us if you can. Uh, Miguel Fernandez uh, says, congratulations for the very informative presentation. Uh, what is the current thinking in regard to the further alignment of the IMAs and KBAs? And is there anything that can be done to promote and further this alignment? Giuseppe. Yeah, so the, the, um, during our workshops, well, first of all, we are, we're lucky that we have within our task force, uh, uh, Charlotte Boyd, who is coordinating uh, a lot of the KBA work uh, stemming out of ICN. And, um, and, and Charlotte has been participating in many of our workshops and uh, she has been helping us to create an interface between the, uh, the IMAs and the KBAs, and as we progress uh, with the uh, with the uh, with the with our different uh, workshops, 
uh, we are progressing with that to and in our last workshop uh, we we had representation at the workshop in Perth in Australia last uh, February um, uh, representation from the KBA people from Australia and I think if I if I'm remember it correctly and, and Eric and Simone can correct me if not that 25 of the EMAs that we had identified where there were candidate EMA at that point in Perth uh, in February were um, um, uh, possibly could be uh, transformed into KBAs. So the thing is that the, um, the KBAs of course uh, as, as many of you know they are based on a different type of criteria for being identified. They are quantitative. Uh, X, a KBA is a KBA if it, for that particular species. If uh, X percent of that species is contained within the KBA, et cetera, et cetera. So it is something different from the IMA in which the criteria are qualitative. And we couldn't have done uh, otherwise because otherwise we would not have been able to come up with. Uh, significant number of emas anywhere if we had to be quantitative because the information in the ocean is not like the information in a wood or in a valley or in a desert um, uh, but so with the uh, with the ema process i think we have been able to create the conditions for quite a few kbas in the ocean to be uh, to be identified and uh we uh, in, in our um, in in our intentions, we are going to strengthen the uh, link between our process uh, and the KBA process more and more as we move from one region to the other. Thank you, Giuseppe. Um, right now, we're getting down to the pokey end here, so uh, still a few questions left. Um, now, uh, Ross McGill, and I, I know that you gave a few examples of this, but maybe you'd like to expand further. Uh, Ross McGill uh, asks, what has the response been, if any, from industry, the military and governments to the IMA tool? Simone, please. Yeah. yeah, again, I can start and then Giuseppe and Eric can, can chip, chip in. We, we have an EMA coordinator who has been receiving uh, over the last uh, few years uh, several uh, requests uh, from the industry, from the military to have uh, access uh, to the GIS uh, layers of the EMAs and use them for their purposes. Uh, I don't have a list uh, with me. There, there has been quite, quite a few requests uh, and we've always been, uh, of course, very open and very willing uh, to circulate the information we we have been collecting. All the data are online, so people can go online and have a look at them, and then they can get in touch through the email addresses to request from for specific layers, GIS files, which are all available upon, upon request. The government as well has been, of course, made aware of these. And I think uh, the best evidence we had uh, was a couple of years ago where there was the ICOMPA meeting in Greece uh, and representative from the European Commission were there. And in pretty much all the presentations that the European Commission members, uh, mainly from the DG environment, gave, uh, there was uh, at least one slide uh, with a reference to the IMAS uh, in the Mediterranean Sea and uh, to what has been done uh, in these uh, in this regard. Of course, we hope this will uh, increase uh, and uh, more governments will, uh, will use uh, the IMA layers and the IMA concept. On top of this, uh, every region that we work in uh, implies uh, two or three regional coordinators who have the, the task uh, to facilitate uh, this uh, process, spreading the word about the IMAs and try to reach out to governments, uh, policymakers, uh, the industry, and the potential user to disseminate uh, the information and to provide uh, access uh, to the layers so that these can be used. So it's, of course, it's not an easy process. We as regional coordinators uh, are mainly scientists or so-called scientists and uh, we don't have the proper language to speak with the governments, but we do try our best uh, to, as at least uh, make them aware that the EMAs are there, the EMAs are available, 
and they can uh, use them. Of course, in a region like the Med, we have ACOBAMs who facilitate the process because they're well aware about the EMAS, the CMS, as well with the resolution that Giuseppe was mentioning. So we have some extra tools uh, to disseminate the world uh, around uh, the government. Thank you. Thank you. Giuseppe or Eric, do you wish to add to that? Eric? Yeah, no, I think that covers it pretty well um, in terms of, you know, where, where we started and where we're, um, uh, you know, what we need to do. It's, it's, I, you know, I think maybe actually it's worth, it's worth mentioning that what we have is a, a massive uh, effort that's going to be needed to uh, spread the word around to governments and to, uh, um, you know, to, to everyone to use the tool, which is the same thing that EPSAs and IBAs and, you know, all, all of these, um, MICO, all of these wonderful tools um, uh, face. That's, that's the next challenge. And, you know, we, we, maybe we need a big uh, PR company to donate its time to get us out there into the world in a big way. Uh, something like that might, might do it. I don't know. Okay, Giuseppe, did you want to add anything or shall we move on to the no, next question? I, I think they said everything very well. Okay, all right. Uh, so sort of continuing along that, that strand, uh, Duncan McDougall asks, um, who, who are the greatest opponents to the implication of IMAs uh, and what are their arguments? Giuseppe, please. Yeah. Yes. Um, Uh, were people who had not really understood what the IMAs were. Uh, and this happened, um, this happened also in international meetings. Uh, at some point it was a problem. Uh, but I noticed that as soon as the, um, we, we had the opportunity of explaining exactly what they are, that there, you know, the, uh, the opposition would dissolve because really what we were we are doing we are extracting from the, uh, the, the 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 mess of scientific knowledge about the ecology of these animals uh, we are making a distillate of uh, knowledge which is actionable so we are actually doing a service to anyone who has interest in working at sea or has interest in regulating work at sea to enable um, to enable correct decisions. So the the EMAs are very carefully designed not to impose anything on anyone. It's just the way it is. It's a description as best as science can do uh, of the situation of the the status quo then because there are laws everywhere there are international laws and national laws that prescribe the protection of marine mammals and of their habitat if you want to make that law, law to be respected you have the elements for doing that so um yeah we we, we had opposition uh, we had the, i'm not going to name the countries i'm not going to name the people of course uh, but as soon as we were able to explain what it really is about, this opposition has dissolved. And so far, we haven't encountered anything substantial. Thank you, Giuseppe. That's certainly a, a very positive um, note to, uh, to come to towards the end of our session. Now, we've got a few uh, questions in here. Some of them, again, are related to specific uh, geographic areas. So people have been asking about the Black Sea and East Antarctica, but I think we've covered that with um, the, what you told us earlier on about the, the, the future geographic coverage of, uh, for the IMA process. So I think we'll, we'll leave those alone. Uh, Simon Barrow has made a, a comment rather than a question, but I, I do think it's worth sharing with the audience. Um, he says, thank you very much for explaining IMAs so well. It provides a very useful tool to start the process of identifying important areas, some of which will go on to be legally binding protected areas. 
Within the EU, IMAs in the EU areas would have been useful in identifying potential marine protected areas under MSF MSFD, which for those who aren't in the know is um, the Marine Strategy Framework Directive. Um, so just a comment, I don't know if you have any response to that. It wasn't really a question, but um, a good one to share. So, uh, okay, good, we'll move on. Uh, now, uh, let me just see. Uh, Giuseppe, going, going back to the species specific uh, question that was asked earlier on whether the IMA process could be used as a model uh, for other species, we've had a, a question from, uh, forgive me for not pronouncing this correctly, Hydran Frisch Namakana, I think, uh, who says, uh, would the IMA team be ready to support shark people who would be interested in looking at a similar tool for these species? Of course, yes, with pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> no brainer. <laughs> Particularly if it's manta rays. Yes, indeed. Always a favorite, always a favorite. Uh, Eric, please. Yes, and I, I would just add that uh, when we were at, um, uh, at an IUCN meeting um, not long ago, well, in the last year, um, uh, about this time of year, in fact, um, we talked with the, several of the key turtle people, um, the head of the IUCN uh, turtle, sea turtle, marine turtle species group, and and we spent several hours with them talking about uh, important turtle areas. You know that that maybe they uh, they went they thought oh this is great we should do this for turtles and and in fact they could do it quite uh, uh, it'd be quite a simple thing to do compared to marine mammals or sharks and and we're so we're we're very open to um, you know to talking about what we've learned and I think between. Uh, bird areas and marine mammal areas. There's a lot of um, information there and examples that can be lend themselves to other species groups. Indeed, plenty, plenty of work to keep us all busy for a while yet. Okay, I'm going to take this uh, as the penultimate question uh, and then I've got one that I want to ask if, if that's okay. Uh, right, uh, Simon Keith says, uh, to what degree do you foresee the shifting climate forcing reviews to what degree do you foresee the shifting climate forcing reviews of IMAs, some areas more quickly than others, some more sensitive? So what, what, how, do, how do you foresee climate change affecting um, the way that you look at IMAs going forward? Um, I don't know, I can take a first stab, uh, Eric and Simone, uh, if you want to follow up. Uh, I think this is gonna be a major problem for us and this is why, and of course, um, doing the EMS is uh, is is uh, funding dependent. So we are not funded forever. We are funded on specific projects. And uh, but supposed supposing that funding is not going to be a problem, well, hopefully, um, we our plan is to revise each region on a decadal basis. And, uh, and one of the reasons why uh, we think that this is the, uh, this is need to be done uh, is that we expect that the uh, EMAs, particularly in the oceans, uh, are going to be uh, very different one decade from the other for many reasons. One is that we learn more about the animals so that we can do better EMAs. Uh, the other is that um, human activities are increasing and so the animals are probably going to react that way by changing their distribution. But the third, which is still human caused, but is a special one, is climate change. And, uh, and therefore, uh, in many cases, there will be EMAs that will need to be shifting, like uh, the animals that they were based on. So I think it's 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 going to be a major challenge um, that need to be done and taken very seriously. Eric and uh, Simone, do you have anything to add to that response? Sorry. Yes. Um, only to say that um, we we have a paper. Um, uh, with uh, Tundi Agardi that was released um, last year. Um, kind of lose track of time with COVID, but I think it was 2019. But um, uh, that talks about an early, you know, IMAs as an early warning 
an early warning method to uh, show the change in uh, uh, in IMAs. And, and of course, climate change is, is one of those. And it may be happening faster than every 10 year period, but uh, we're, you know, we're trying to develop ways to adjust these as needed. And uh, so, you know, that's, that's, that's all we can do. I mean, there, there are gonna be a lot of things that affect movement of marine mammals, you know, principally food. Um, and, and where that prey goes, uh, uh, they're gonna go too. And, and that's driven by not only climate change, but other things. Thanks, Eric. Uh, Simone, nothing, nothing to add? You're sitting very casual, so, okay, good. Um, right, I, as we're approaching half past three now, I'm going to ask you a final question, which is not a technical question. Uh, it's more um, to ask you for your reflections on um, how you feel the process has gone, and uh, how, you know, what do you feel the side benefits have been? How has it been as an experience for you as a team doing this process? Eric. Well, shall I start, Giuseppe? I'll, I'll, yeah, I, th I think, I mean, it's been very, very interesting and very, uh, um, you know, seat of the pants at, some, at times. And, and yet there was an overall structure that was really excellent in terms of, um, you know, the Gobiecki project having developed um, the idea that it would not only be identification but it would be implementation so that there would be three examples or case studies. And, you know, in the beginning we thought, well, we'd like to just get the identification done. But I think we, we quickly saw that these um, further um, down the road type of exercises were really valuable in terms of in, informing where we were going and what, what was useful and what wasn't useful. And those implementation exercises were not, 100% successful. They were, you know, we were learning uh, every day, uh, you know, when we'd spend a, a week or 10 days away uh, in in uh, the three areas, Palau, Andaman Islands, and uh, Mozambique. And I think the, um, uh, you know, I think the whole process, it's, it's, it's been bumpy for all kinds of reasons. Uh, and COVID has made it, you know, give us another major bump and everybody else too, of course. Uh, but uh, overall, I would say it's been an excellent learning experience and, uh, you know, uh, wonderful personally and, and for the group of us as well. Um, but we also see how far we have to go and what we have to learn from, from the whole thing. Giuseppe, do you want to? Uh, yeah, your uh, I, I, I can only echo what uh, Eric said. In addition to that, I think uh, it has been extremely exciting. Uh, you know, go from 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 zero uh, to one third of the ocean in five years. And uh, but the um, one of the most uh, uh, pleasant uh, pleasant uh, aspect of this is to meet all these groups of people in the distant regions and uh and that has been great fun great fun to you know to the workshops and you know be with uh with wonderful people for five days and also you know create uh, contacts with them uh, that you know continue we we wish them to continue and uh and this is something that i'm a little bit afraid uh with the uh, virtual with the passage to virtual you know it, there are many reasons not just covid uh, that are pushing in that direction and um, but I hope that in the future we can uh, we can go back to the uh, to the old way of doing things you know being uh, you know being in touch physically with people today people almost shudder oh physical horrible stay away from me no no um, we uh, we hope that we can do that again we certainly hope that too. Uh, Simone, do you have uh, thoughts to add before yes, we sign up? Yes, I'm gonna stress what they, they both said. It's a very exciting process. It's extremely rewarding when you look on the e-atlas and you see you know, little dots populating uh, the planet. And you know, it's thanks to this uh, wonderful uh, week that we spend uh, together with uh, 13, uh, 30, 40 people 
that we we know or we know partially. So it, it really becomes quite quite bonding. And I have to say that I was very skeptical when Giuseppe started talking to me about Dimas quite a few years ago. He said, oh, come on, not another list of things on a piece of paper. And he said, no, no, please trust me. And you know, it took a while, but at the end, I, I, I really entered into this and I, I can only be happy that Giuseppe insisted. He could have said, okay, we go with someone else, but he didn't. So thank you again. And I think it's a really, really nice process. And all this interest, all this effort, almost worldwide, just supports and through this. So I, mean, I think it's really, really exciting. Thank you. And yes, indeed, congratulations to all three of you, because I know that the volume of work that this process has entailed has been massive. So hats off to you three for, for, for pushing on with it and, and, and setting a good example for, for the rest of the conservation community. Um, if it's okay with everyone, I'm going to draw the session to a close now. Giuseppe has got a word. Yeah, I, know I just wanted to add that um, we are very grateful to Gobi, of course. Oh, yeah. not, uh, <laughs> we are your not, servants. <laughs> it's not just lip service, you know, but Gobi really gave the Imas a big, big push. Uh, without that, I don't know where we would be now. Oh, well, it's very kind of you and, and it, it has been our privilege, believe me. Um, well, people, um, I'm very, um, well, it's been, a, it's been a great session, actually. It's been very, very informative. Thank you for the fantastic presentations. Um, thank you to everyone online for attending. Uh, I think at our peak, we had 101 attendees, which is absolutely fantastic. Um, the recording of this webinar will be available in due course on the Gobi website. Um, our next session uh, will take place on the 12th of November. We're still just sorting out the, uh, the exact time for it because um, we've got speakers from a number of different time zones, which is always a bit tricky. Um, but keep your eyes peeled and we will um, announce the, um, the, the time and the arrangements um, online as soon as we have them. Um, but the next session will focus on the migratory uh, connectivity in the ocean system, myco system, uh, with presentations from um, Duke University and University of Queensland. So please tune in for that. Um, and I'm just going to ask Chris, did I forget anything? No? Okay, <laughs> good. Chris, Chris keeps us all in check. So without him, we'd be completely lost. But again, thank you to our presenters. Thank you, Simone, for your input to the Q&A. Thank you, to everyone, for attending, and we will see you next time. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, everyone.